Later on, after college, started singing in New York City, became a professional concert and opera singer. And it was a great job. It paid exceedingly well. And you were with a hundred of the best young singers in New York City. And it was with the New York choral artists behind Leonard Bernstein, who was one of the best, very famous for conducting this particular piece of music. And I thought, I started with that piece and I ended with that piece. And after about six months, I took Shahada and uh, left my performing career. My family was very anti-hijab, my brother particularly, so I was eventually disowned by my brother. But um, I remember getting on a bus one morning and the bus wasn't even full. And I looked out the window, a man caught my eye and he gave me this look and he walked on the bus and came to me and said, is this seat empty or available? And I said, no, the bus is empty, you know, go away. When I wore hijab, I felt so anonymous that way. It's like, okay, now you need to appreciate me, not for my looks, but for my intellect and my heart and my manners and who I am as a person, who I am. One woman even came to me, she said, oh, you're ashamed of your body, you wanna cover it? Assalamu alaikum, Sister Noor Saada. Thank you for accepting our invitation. We are very happy to have you with us. I want to start with who is Noor Saada? Can you tell us briefly about your life? Yes, I was born in central Wisconsin and I was interested in music, kept singing all my life. Then I moved to New York City later on after college, started singing in New York City, became a professional concert and opera singer and walked into a coffee shop when I was 36 years of age and met an Egyptian Muslim, didn't know anything about Islam, started asking, was amazed at what I learned because I knew nothing about Islam. And after about six months, I took Shahada and uh, left my performing career and wondering what to do after that. What was the thing that made you question your beliefs? Was it an event or a thought and when was that? I don't think I questioned anything. I was just kind of happy going along with my life. I was a singer and I believed in God. And I remember when I had to go through, most Christians have to go through sort of a confirmation class. So in our church, when you were 15 and sort of like of an adult age, you had to go to the church and kind of reaffirm that I'm really this, right? I'm really a Christian, as I think Muslims should do too, is that when they become adults born, Muslims should reaffirm really the Shahada and take it seriously. But so when we had a new minister and another friend of mine, we used to just ask a lot of questions and he'd throw us out of class for asking questions. At one time I was thinking to marry a Catholic man and he said, well, I'd like you to become Catholic. And I said, okay, let me talk to some people. And if you can convince me, I don't think you can, but if you can convince me, I'll be Catholic. And I went and I started to ask questions about, you know, why do I have to worship Mary? And why do I have to confess to a mortal person? And can I just confess to God? And they threw me out too. I was very nice about it. I wasn't argumentative, but I said, no, if you can't answer me why I'm worshiping Mary, for example, or why I'm confessing to someone. I can't. I can't. So I really wasn't questioning. And I happened to be singing in a church on Thursdays and Sundays. And I decided we went to the church it was Unitarian. And that's where everybody can come and worship Jews and Christians alike. And it was before Christmas. And our choir director said, the congregation is complaining that we talk about God too much. We sing about God. So whenever we see the word God in our songs, we're going to change it to love. Love did this and love did that. And I said, that's it. I'm a Muslim. Tell us. On Sunday, I'm going to come and do my job, and then I'm going to tell them I can't sing here anymore. I'm a Muslim now. So that Sunday morning, I got up and I made a ghusl. I asked my friends, what do I do? He made a ghusl, and I said in my heart that, you know, the shahada. And I went to the church and said afterwards, I said, I'm sorry, but I quit. They said, what? It's Christmas. You can't quit. And I went down to the coffee shop and my friend was there with his a friend. And I said, it's two of you, right? And they said, for what? I said, to take shahada. I need two Muslim witnesses, right? So I never did it in a mosque. I did it in a coffee shop in Manhattan. I took my shahada, alhamdulillah. Assalamu alaikum, brothers and sisters. We saw that 80% of our audience, including this video, are not subscribed to our channel. As you know, we are a non-profit organization and advertisements are disabled on our videos. So the only reason we are asking for this is to spread the truth. It may seem like a small act, but inshallah, it may be a means of guidance for many people. Now let's click the subscribe button and let's walk as an eternal passenger. Was there anything that intimidated you to take this final step of becoming Muslim? Honestly, no, even hijab, I couldn't wait to put it on. What was difficult is my singer friends all gave me a lot of hassle. One woman even came to me, she said, oh, you're ashamed of your body, you want to cover it? Because I was new, I thought, I, no, that's not what it means. You just don't understand, but I don't have the tools yet. I don't have a way to explain it to you. I just know it's right. Because I had been, women get so harassed by men. It's just so normal. In New York particularly, I was tall and fair and kind of looking the part of the singer. You know, I dressed not flamboyantly, but I dressed 
very nicely. And I was tall and fair in a city of a lot of people of mixed uh, diversity. And I was always so annoyed by men that just thought it was their right to approach me. Construction workers could whistle and cat call any woman who walked by. I remember getting on a bus one morning and the bus wasn't even full. And I looked out the window, a man caught my eye and he gave me this look. And he walked on the bus and came to me and said, is this seat empty or available? And I said, no, the bus is empty. You know, go away. I wore hijab. I felt so anonymous that way. It's like, okay, now you need to appreciate me, not for my looks, but for my intellect and my heart and my manners and who I am as a person, who I am, who, are, who Noor is, subhanAllah. And I had a very good brother that I would go out with um, for these jobs. And he was a, a born again Christian. He was very religious also. And he even told me he read the Quran. So he knew where I was coming from. So I thought, okay, I still need to make money. And this paid very well. So I'm going out to sing for children. So I think this is a way I can, I can still, you know, still stay in music. I had one director say, I was planning this big work just for you this year. And I said, oh, okay, you know, but a lot of people gave me an awful lot of grief and uh, told me I was following a, a cult and that this Egyptian was going to take me off to Egypt and put me in a sex slave market. I'm like, what? It was crazy. And my parents thought I was, you know, following a fad and a cult and I'd get over it. I said, but I never did anything like this before. I was never that kind of a person. How would you think that? And I felt, you know, people loved me and, and thought well of me. So I thought when I became Muslim and I shared it, they'd all take shahada. Like, ah, oh, no. My friend cautioned me not to do it right away, even though I wanted to. I started dressing more modestly, like wearing jackets down to my wrist and longer skirts and things. But I still had the hair and the makeup. So it didn't stop the men from blabbing at me and stuff on the streets. So I thought this is not modest enough. But when I went back to New York with hijab, really, I was anonymous, except for Muslims that would race over to pick me up in their taxis and things like that. Like, are you an American? My family was very anti-hijab, my brother particularly. So I was eventually disowned by my brother. But um, my brother once told me when I was living at home that he would come and lock the doors on my mother's house if I put that thing on my head. When you took your shahada, what feelings did you have? I was just so happy. And again, like I said, you know, knowing about Islam, just all the puzzle pieces came together. I think I was so convinced early, even before I took Shahada, that was just a formal, you know, recognition that I was a Muslim. But I think I was just so happy about it from the get go. And, you know, alhamdulillah that my friends didn't agree with me and everybody argued because I kind of just set, shut myself off from everyone. And I went back to working like clerical jobs in New York, which I had done before I started singing professionally and making a career and supporting myself with singing. So I would just work the nine to five and go home and just honestly read Quran from cover to cover in English. I was really kind of shut off from everyone. I turned my phone off. I didn't take calls. I didn't go out and see people. And it was a really awful time. It was like a year or two that I sort of sequestered myself that way, just going out for work. I didn't get out in the nature and do the things I love to do. I didn't see people. But I just kept reading Quran over and over again. And when I look back in hindsight, it was the best thing I could have happened to me, even though it was difficult. So how did your family and the people around you react to your conversion to Islam? Uh, not very well. Most of my singer friends either made fun of the Egyptian that I met or they ridiculed some of the ideas. One of my best friends said to me, oh, are you ashamed of your body? Now you want to cover it. So I, I kind of shut the door to people for a while. And my family weren't opposed to the religious aspects, but um, my family really hated the idea of hijab. When I left New York and I went back home to live with my mom, they were very opposed to that. My brother even said that he would uh, change the locks on my mother's house if I put that thing on my head. Which part of the Quran hit you the most, affected you the most when you started reading it? My favorite surah has always been Surah Al-Hadid, number 57. It always it begins praising Allah beautifully. I am with you wherever you are. Allah is with you wherever you are. And that always gives me a lot of comfort. It's not like I'm watching you. It's more like it's a comfort that Allah is always there, hearing and seeing in a really lovely, uh, supportive way, that he's always there. You don't have to worry. You don't have to fear. That was always supportive. And there's a very nice verse at the end that says, Believe in his lot, messenger, and Allah will give you a double portion of his mercy. He will give you a light by which to walk by. And that's where I got my name, Noor, from. He will forgive you your, your past. And I always tell that to converts when they're having a difficult time. So what was the hardest thing that you had to go through after becoming a Muslim? I think I'm, I'm outwardly a very happy camper and a positive person. And I often say that if you go out into the world with a good attitude and you feel comfortable in your hijab particularly, bad stuff doesn't come your way. I've seen friends that are constantly having problems out in public with their hijab. And I don't want to say this is a rule of thumb, but I think sometimes if you bring a little bit of, like the days I don't feel well, I don't get as much positive feedback from people as if my vibes are sending out vibes that bring bad vibes back. So I usually go out pretty happy campers. So I have never really had any 
anything nasty said or done to me as a Muslim. I've had funny things said, but mostly I've had beautiful things. I was in a hotel where they had a special needs conference and a little girl walked past me and she turned to her mommy and she said, mommy, I've just seen an angel. I've had more comments like that than nasty ones. Even when I go out with my mom in central Wisconsin wearing shawar kameez and a hijab, what could I wear back then and all those many years ago, people would come up and compliment like, oh, beautiful clothes. Where do you get that scarf? Is that from here? So those are kind of hopeful things. Can you tell us how you felt when you first prayed? Unfortunately, I'm sorry to say, just wasn't all that, wasn't all the bells and whistles that people talk about. But I did have an experience that was very convincing to me. You know, my people, my friends were telling me, it's really good to get up and make tahajjud in the middle of the night. One night I woke up about 2 a.m. and I was living in New York still, and I was on a bottom floor apartment. And we always got a lot of cats that were uh, mating in the backyard. And it was a very annoying sound for me. And so I got up to pray and I was in the middle of my prayer and all of a sudden the cat started. And I said, oh, Allah, not tonight, not tonight. And it was if they were like in the middle of their amp was cut off like that. And I said, oh, subhanAllah, alhamdulillah. So that was like, okay, I'm, I'm very convinced about this prayer. I mean, it was, they were cut off and there was no more, more sound for the rest of the night immediately after I made this dua. Was there any prejudice against Islam in Wisconsin or in New York? If there was any, what do you think the reason is? People just didn't know. I mean, there wasn't too much going on. Like my community in Wisconsin, for example, they bought a lot that was out in the middle of a cornfield, out in the middle of nowhere, and they put a house on it, not a mosque, but a house at a funny angle. But they didn't want a mailbox. They didn't want a Hillel up on top or anything, or Crescent Moon or anything. They didn't want to know people to know they were there. They were afraid still. And this is well before 9-11. But when I joined the community, because I was a native English speaker, I started, when I would read articles that the paper would write about the Muslim community, it's like, dear God, what are they saying? They would say, oh, this Muslim woman gets up in Ramadan and she washes her feet. I'm like, okay, okay, let me go talk to them. So I started a relationship with the newspapers. And then we started that year, the newspaper did a full page color spread on the Muslim community during Ramadan. That's not me. That's Allah using me and my abilities as an American and accessible person and having English. But we started in a relationship with the newspaper, so people got to know us, and we started doing some interfaith and things like that. So on the day of 9-11, my community, I wasn't there anymore, my community told me that people came to them carrying flowers and saying, we know this isn't you. I've often say if someone knows one Muslim, whether it's a neighbor, a co-worker, or your child's classmate at school, it changes their whole opinion because they get to hear the other side of things. Again, they're just bombarded by the sound bites by non-alive, by ISIS, by this, by that. And of course, they lump us all in under one umbrella. And it's very hard to fight that Western media. It's very hard to fight the Western media. It's very prevalent. And I said, as I said before, they're very good at their sound bites. They just keep repeating the same old nonsense over and over. It's Israel's 9-11. Like, oh, fine, thanks. That's going to help a lot. You know? So people just don't know. So it really it behooves us, and it's incumbent on us as Muslims in our deen. Dawah is one of the pillars of Islam. Soft dawah. You don't have to go out and shove your pamphlets down their throat. I used to tell people, they were asking sisters, asking, you know, how do we do dawah? And I said, soft dawah, sisters. When you're out walking, smile, say hello. You know, my neighbors will come by and say, oh, did you have a nice holiday, Ida? I see your, your Ramadan halal's up. It must be Ramadan. And how was your holiday? And, you know, they know. They see, they see my lights come up. They said, oh, it's Ramadan. Isn't it supposed to be in February? It's like, no, it, it moves around. That's a simple do thing to do. Even a smile is charity. I'm, I, maybe I'm dumb, but I just keep smiling. This is my way to go. It's just, and the prophet said it's charity. So the line was him. What quality, what attribute of the prophet ﷺ impressed you the most? I think what impresses me the most about the Prophet وسلم, is that he was so merciful and he had such an understanding of human psychology. He knew how to talk to each individual person. He knew when to be tough with someone. He knew when to be soft and gentle and merciful. You know, there's this book that he was rated the most one of the most 100 influential people in the world. He was rated number one. It's incontestable. There's just so much about him from every level as as a as a leader, as a prophet, as a human being, as a father, as a, a husband. There's so many positions where he's just the most impressive person you can imagine. And one of the things I worried about, I guess, when I was a new Muslim is how would I come to love Muhammad because I didn't know him. And I didn't want to confuse him with how Christians confuse Jesus. And people would say, oh, you worship Muhammad. I'm like, no, 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 no. Muhammad is a man. Muhammad is a prophet. Muhammad is a rasul. He's a messenger. So I was a little bit worried. But as you, of course, as you get to know him, you come to love him so much. So if you had the chance to witness one moment of his life, what would you choose? That scene of comfort and that she was his beloved wife for all those years when everybody was taking multiple lives and the fact that some historians say she was older. But that particular scene with him so terrified and shaking under a blanket 
asking her to cover him is very touching. And I always say, I would like to think I would have been like Khadija, that I would have been there and supporting him and saying those same things to him. If you had a chance to speak directly to all the non-Muslims in the world, what would you like to say to them? That we're just all human. We are all humans. We have the same hopes and dreams and fears and problems and everything else. There isn't anybody lesser by virtue of their skin color. And that's what's so clear in Islam, too. We might not always walk the talk as Muslims, but Allah created us differently. Know each other. That's an important verse, to know each other, not to immediately jump to the other side. And come to, it, it will make your life so much better. It will open doors to your life. Sister Rosada, thank you so much for your sincere answers and sharing your beautiful story. May Allah make it a means of inspiration and maybe guidance for many people, inshallah. Amen, amen. May Allah also bless you all for preparing these and sharing our stories. Inshallah, Allah wants to enter his jannah, inshallah. Amen, amen. And you also, inshallah.